All right, let's start. So before we start, I want to be very sure that the strategic framework and strategic alignment you are very clear about in order to discuss strategy. So tell me, what is strategic framework? And tell loudly so that it can be recorded. Sir, strategic framework means. Yeah, what are framework? What is that? Just say that. All right. What are these forces? Potential entrance, all right. What else? Bargaining power of buyers, good. What else? Threat of substitutes, good. Bargaining power of suppliers. Speak into it. Core is competition, the existing competition that you are in. Okay. What is strategic alignment? Yes. Strategic alignment, what do you understand by that? If you don't know, some friend will answer. She is sitting there all eager to answer. I can see that. No? Who wants to answer? Strategic alignment. It's simple common sense. What do you align with what? One at a time. Yeah, Ashish. Strategy you align with? All right. Anything else you align it with? Yeah, there are external factors, you know. It's really very simple. You have internal and you have external, all right. Internal, you have to have a vision and an objective, right. Then you have to accomplish that vision and objective. So you have to make a strategy or a strategic plan. When you make the strategic plan, there are some components of that. You may do a SWOT analysis or you may do any other type of analysis. Having done that analysis, you are in a position to make a plan. Now that plan must align itself to accomplish your vision. Now how do you accomplish it? You have to look outwards then, right? When you look outwards, you see the external context. What is outside? What is the competition? All right? What is the change coming in the environment and so on? All right? And what is that competitive advantage you are seeking? Remember the first lecture we said? You know, we had a historical thing, competitive advantage. What did we say? There was a principle which was enunciated by a mathematician. What did he say? The same species, you know, they cannot coexist together in the environment. One will displace the other. Unless, and who will displace the other? The one which has competitive advantage. So, it is the same in the market warfare, in the market environment, unless you continually seek and attain competitive advantage over competitors, okay, in that environment, you will perish. Otherwise, you exit that environment and enter another environment where there is less competition, where you can have an advantage to start with. So, these are the choices you have. So, external context to gain competitive advantage. Then, you have to align your organization with the external context in order to gain this competitive advantage. Okay? Now, when you align organization, what does it mean? What is aligning organization? Okay? So, we will just speak for another few minutes on strategic alignment to give you a backdrop. Then we will get into the case. Strategic alignment is all for gaining competitive advantage. All right. Organization design, this is a component of strategic alignment. We have studied organization dynamics and structure, structure and dynamics, right. So, at length we have talked of the various options which you have in organization design. That comes in handy now when you go for your strategic plan. Organization structure, organization systems and procedures. Remember we talked of formalization, the yes and no's, what is the way you know you have to do it and what is the manner in which, what are the rules and what does that control? It controls information flow, is it not? And organization culture. We also said that irrespective of the organization chart, there is always an undercurrent 
and underlying powerful potent force which is acting and that is the cultural force which can be destructive or it can be very constructive uh, which will have its direct effect positive or negative on the performance of the organization okay any questions on this no questions effective factors we are calling effective factors coordination and incentives management must address questions on coordination plus incentives <coughs> for clarity in problem definition what does this mean it means when you go and study a company you are trying to diagnose the company with a view to finding out whether the way the company is designed that organization is designed all right in terms of its structure in terms of its systems and procedures and what is the culture of training when you look at that okay you have to ask some questions in order to diagnose and the questions are all pertaining to finding out whether there is any problem which is existing and except in ideal system every company has some problem or the other like every individual yes or no okay now coordination is one area where you have large number of problems in any organization because you have tasks which are done by various groups or departments they are all interdependent and in order to coordinate the effort unless they are congruent they don't deliver a whole you know which is optimum so that is always a problem incentive incentives what does incentives mean what is in it for me you know we we talked of in the last semester individual behavior and group behavior in organizations individual behavior is dependent on the kind of incentives incentives doesn't only mean monetary it means other types of incentives incentives acceptance in the organization the recognition you get the kind of cordiality which exists in while doing your work in the organization these are all types of incentives so when you diagnose organization you have to look at this carefully you must address these questions okay so we are looking at problem of coordination how does critical information reach the company this is one of the questions you ask if you are a consultant how does it map the flow of the information is there a bottleneck is it reaching the right people okay how should the information traverse through the company how is it doing now and how should it and when you say how should it this is always against the backdrop of what what is the strategy of this company to give an example if your strategy is to be what shall we say basic strategy low cost say you want to be a cost leader cost leader means with amongst your competitors you have the lowest cost for the same quality they will have a certain pattern of information flow all right on the other hand if your strategy is not low cost but let's say you want to be the best delivery delivery in all aspects <coughs> existing products new products if it is new products that means you must the shortest time right from conceptualization of the product to development design productionizing all right and selling it going to the market so what what do you call that time to market there is a time if it is existing product what is the kind of delivery is it from the day you get the order when do you deliver it to the client if that is your basic strategy then the information flow which you design will it be the same as in the first case for low cost it will be not the same it will be a little different how will it be different for example say in the first case low cost yeah Costly. That's one. Investment cost must be low. What else? What about the routing? How the information flows? Who has the information? Will the sales persons, all the sales people, should get a cost picture every day? Is that necessary? Yes. 
Uh, or should the HR people get the cost? What should be the routing? Why are you laughing? Control systems are designed with this in mind. Who contribute to adding cost to the company? Right. So they should have the real time data, they should have feedback whether they are going on budget, not going on budget. Whereas, on the, on the other hand, if it is time to market, let us say, or best delivery, delivery leader, what kind of information flow should be there? Who should have information? Do you think that the production people should know about the deliveries? If that is your strategy, time to market? Some people say yes, some people say no. So, what is the right answer? How will the production people contribute to long deliveries or short deliveries? That is the question. Will they contribute? Yes, sir. They will. Now, if your basic strategy is to be the delivery leader and if the production provide a vital input into the delivery time, they should also be up to date with the information. What about sales people? What about finance? Should they know the delivery periods? Yes. Yes or no? Do not guess. Tell me why. They can plan the cash flow accordingly. Cash flow is planned on budget. Say they give the budget. And the budget is based on my company is giving you the product in two weeks delivery time. So, I am assuming throughout the year, whatever is the volume of products that I have, I will give in two weeks. So, the turnover is known. The finance has that data. But, the what I am only proposing, I agree with all you are saying. I am saying that that is known at the beginning of the year. If you are in a standard product regime, the sales will have to give a forecast of the volumes. You may make the delivery payment does not come, then what happens? That is another side. I am saying if you want to be the leader in delivering fast. Of course, you can, but we are not addressing that topic. What we are saying, in order to design information flow, it is only those who are directly involved in contributing to the strategy who are involved, is not it? So, in my view, the finance people sitting, they do not require to know the day to day. Customer XYZ, he had, we have given delivery in two weeks on schedule. Customer A, B, C, we have given after 14 days plus 2 days time overrun. Is going to help him? It's not going to help him. Not day to day. So, but if the information is available for everyone, what's the answer? Because too much information is called information diarrhea. Now, I have been in jobs where you have, you know, printouts by the kilo coming in. So, not right? the then. How much time do you have, my friend, when you are sitting on a computer? It all comes at cost. And I do not think, as common sense, if the more information you make to more people, Irrespective of whether they have a role, whether they can contribute, I think it is just silly. And in ERP also, everyone is not authorized to know all the information. No, apart from ERP. ERP is a tool. ERP is a tool. The tool has to be designed in a proper manner also, is it not? If the company is 
company strategy is to make a delivery then all the department in the company are geared toward delivery my friends i am asking which are those we are debating which are those departments all the departments all departments meeting the delivery schedule oh, i think that is too simplistic you have five, let's say in this 4000 people are there in a company all 4000 should are theoretically they involved in delivery theoretically you can prove that all of them should have access from erp system with a computer does it make sense i mean we have to be practical we are practical managers so that is not going to be optimum system no whenever you you make any proposal or plan you the touchstone is is it practical imagine 4000 pcs you know lying at every shop floor and a huge erp you have paid 100 crores for it what are you getting out of it it just adds to cost the trick in management is you must optimize that is whatever value you are adding in terms of investments you should get something more in return isn't it that is the whole idea of business okay so anyway these are the sort of questions who should be the decision maker for what type of decision okay what activity should be made into independent groups and what not what linkages horizontal linkages should be there for better coordination what norms and decision rules should be enunciated what are the beliefs about the company and the environment in which it operates which is most important what about incentives because incentives also drives the individual what activities are most critical for effective performance of the company if you are a r&d driven company r&d may be your most critical activity what kind of incentives do you give to the r&d people if you if you give them the slowest promotions are you going to attract strong r&d people you want if you make them a hero within the organization too much that also will mitigate against performance of the other groups and is interdependent but at the same time you have to position the reward systems and the promotions so that they get recognition that they are driving this company that is the strategy main strategy which are those performance dimensions which can be quantified measured regularly because unless you can quantify and measure regularly you will probably make a mistake in rewarding the right person it may go purely on subjective you can't get away from subjective but to the extent possible measurement yields quantification quantification yields better appraisal of work done right and what is the type of culture which will support good productive performance behavior what is the type of culture yesterday we spent 2 hours on a cultural issue basically i call it a cultural issue 2 hours time we spent Huh? You call it a cultural issue also, or no? Yesterday night. Yeah, non-cultural. What kind of recruitment and performance review systems would be appropriate? aligning strategy and organization there must be a good fit between the company's organization design and its competitive advantage which we just discussed the organization design arises out of company's vision and objectives and addresses the organization coordination and incentive problem which must support the company's strategy to attain competitive advantage in order to create the optimum organization design the company can suitably alter its organization structure organization systems organization procedures and organization culture and conceptually you can represent it aligning strategy and organization you have the competitive advantage which you are seeking you have a external context things in the outside environment within the company the problems of coordination incentive and these we can call the levers architecture or the structure of the company routines or you can put systems and procedures which are routines and the culture of the company
Any questions? <coughs> no questions. All right. So now it's ten past four. We can go on. We can go on to the group case presentations. All right. Shall we start with group one or group six? Can we do it this way? We'll go to one and then we'll go to six. Then we'll come to two and go to five. That will be fair and equitable. Okay? All right. Here is another conceptualization. Who is going to present for group one? Amit Kumar. All right, come Amit Kumar, come from this side. So the case is Buddy solvent prepared by Professor K. Ramchandan. Come here. You require the computer? He requires the computer. Computer. Let's see your ingenuity, resourcefulness as a manager. Huh? <laughs> uh, by the way, there are questions for group one and two. Make your presentation, but spend a few minutes on this. Did Dr. Buddy have a strategic plan? It may already be there in your presentation. Did he follow any business strategy? Huh? <laughs> Answer these questions also. All right, your now is about 4.11, you have 10 minutes, so 4.21. Your time starts now. That's close, that's close. I'll hold it. Yeah. yeah, near your mouth, yeah. Good afternoon, friends. Good, Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. I will be presenting the analysis of strategy for buddy solvent. Firstly, I would uh, do the SWOT analysis, so straight away going on to the strengths. Uh, these, uh, uh, Buddy's group was a highly profitable and cash rich company. Uh, as you have uh, seen from the figures given that uh, uh, it, uh, in uh, year 1989 for an investment of 50 lakhs it had a, turno a sales turnover of 250 lakhs. And also uh, for the, uh, there were products uh, for which it had uh, earned more than 100% profit. Uh, also the products were very valuable for the customer. They, uh, they, uh, Buddy had uh, managed uh, to get a loyal and financial sound, uh, financially sound dealers who, uh, who were uh, located uh, strat uh, strategically all, ac all across the country and uh, they provided him with uh, market information. Uh, uh, Buddy had a disciplined workforce and uh, he believed in leading by example. Also uh, he maintained very uh, good relationship uh, with his uh, Employees, employers, employees, and uh, he uh, uh, took uh, care to see uh, that uh, they were properly groomed and uh, they, uh, they were properly developed. There was a diversified product portfolio, and uh, which catered to the textile industry, the pesticide, the uh, paint industry, as well as the agricultural sector. And uh, but these had a long-term contract for the raw materials. He uh, entered into uh, contracts of around five years for getting uh, uh, the raw materials at uh, prefixed prices. Uh, the uh, user industries were not concentrated. They were spread all over the all over India in different parts and uh, so uh, there were no real uh, bargaining power from the uh, customer side. And uh, but these uh, also managed, uh, maintained a very uh, good customer relationship and he provided uh, customers in uh, customized solutions. And uh, there were a high psychological and financial switching costs associated with the uh, pr uh, the solvents. Now the weaknesses, the buddy is operated in niche market and this could be a weakness in the sense that uh, the larger part of the uh, normal market was left unexplored. 
the textile solvents formed 50% of the sales. And now this was a very big weakness in the sense that uh, mm, uh, there were intense competition in the textile sector. As an uh, example in the case, uh, when IOC had launched a, a solvent uh, at a lower price, uh, but these immediately had to lower the price. And uh, uh, these being a pre premium, but the being a premium, a uh, major market segment was left unexplored. And last of all, the cash payments was expected uh, by the company. So uh, uh, I, in, I feel that a lot of customers who uh, uh, do business on the credit basis were lost. Now the opportunities, uh, uh, they, uh, they could cater to the non-premium segments. Uh, there was the uh, ability to develop other specialized products for similar applications. Now Buddies had uh, worked uh, to develop uh, the solvents uh, for the uh, um, rubber plantation as well as for the paint industry, which were uh, quite successful. So uh, likewise, he could uh, diversify his products and uh, find out other such profitable sectors. And uh, the large orders could be expected in future as these as his customers were highly satisfied. And but he took special interest in uh, taking care that uh, uh, he pro uh, provided uh, proper customer service. He rang up the customers uh, and provided individual attention to all of them. And last of all, the customer industry was growing. Uh, it was mentioned in the case that uh, uh, textile industries uh, uh, came into the uh, existence, uh, and uh, it was cited that Reliance had a demand of 70,000 tons per day. Uh, so this was a very big opportunity. Now the threats, the uh, substitute, there were, uh, there is a large chance of substitute products in the chemical industry and uh, uh, also low cost products. Now uh, the, uh, I would like to uh, state the strategy for buddies. Uh, we feel uh, our group had well that uh, the, from the financial results given, uh, buddies was a, a pretty, it was doing very well. Uh, from uh, uh, 1985 to 1989, uh, the investment had uh, uh, doubled, whereas the sales turnover had uh, increased threefold. So we feel that uh, there was no uh, nothing right uh, wrong in, in the strategy adopted by Buddies, and uh, the strategy uh, adopted by Buddy was it has a distinct competence. It had uh, provide uh, it had manufactured uh, special uh, com uh, products for the uh, different segments and. Uh, there was a niche marketing approach. It had uh, uh, this approach was uh, uh, useful in the sense that uh, in these segments there was very little competition and uh, uh, the profit margin was very high. And the, the third was the uniqueness of the product. Uh, it is mentioned in the case that uh, uh, natural condensate gas was being used uh, uh, in the um, solvents, but when its prices, uh, when its availability went down. Uh, they used they substitute by kerosene, which was uh, costlier. But uh, still, then there was no marketing problem because of the unique drying properties of the solvents. And uh, there was a, a strategic pricing, uh, a strategic pricing according to the market uh, forces. Uh, it, it, uh, but these had a very close look at the market, and uh, they were very responsive. Whenever uh, they judged uh, that uh, a, a new competitor had entered into the market with. Uh, uh, with a with a uh, substitute product or a, a similar product with the low price, it Im immediately uh, responded uh, by uh, by following the uh, market trends and accordingly uh, producing a similar product or uh, uh, lowering its prices. And uh, it had careful selection of channel partners. Now this was a very important factor uh, because uh, uh, the dealers were the major. Uh, the major uh, they uh, they helped in generating the major chunk of the business now i would like to uh, fit this uh, case into the porter's model uh, first of all the threat of new entrants uh, this was a very uh, not a cash uh, a capital intensive business as we have seen that uh, our, uh, with a uh, investment of around 50 lakhs uh, the turnover was 250 lakhs so entry barriers are pretty low and there was a high chance of uh, new entrants and uh, there was high switching cost. It has been uh, specified in the case that uh, uh, the uh, textile manufacturers were uh, uh, very hesitant in switching to substitute products because uh, they feared that they had to change the entire production setup. And uh, uh, that would involve a lot of cost and time. Now there was the threat of, uh, the threat of substitutes. The threat of substitutes, as I mentioned, was pretty high. Uh, and the bargaining power of buyers. 
big uh, big textile manufacturers who bought solvents in bulk they had a uh, they had some by uh, bar bargaining power and since the product was undifferentiated uh, they again the buyers had uh, definite bargaining power and the uh, product function was critical so uh, in that sense the uh, bargaining power was low the bargaining power of suppliers the product was crucial to the buyers i have mentioned so in that sense the uh, suppliers had a uh, higher bargaining power and the industry rivalry uh, there is not substantial industry industry rivalry and uh, the new entrants which had uh, managed to get through were uh, not very successful as uh, but these adopted uh, uh, suitable strategies to crush them <coughs> now i w uh, we have a few recommendations the present strategy was a winning strategy so they, uh, i would propose no change in the strategy uh, now since the company was growing it i, I feel that uh, it should be more formalized as yesterday we had a discussion and uh, uh, professor dean had told that uh, as the college increases we get we have to uh, make the rules more formalized in that sense i uh, the rules need uh, rules need to be established and uh, last but not the least uh, there is nothing mentioned about the mission and vision, vision statement so i would propose that uh, mission vision statements along with short term goals and objectives should be developed thank you thank you we will have 5 minutes question answers tell me amit yes. did you follow any business strategy if so can you say what is the strategy in few words strategy you have said one is niche market yes, all right that's one you also said that you know strategic pricing that's a strategy you followed niche market yes. strategic pricing and support of channel partners support of channel what do you mean by this support of channel partners it, it, uh, it has been give them a big commission not commission but then uh, giving them uh, incentives also incentive is commission after all if i am a dealer yeah, if they are representing reliance or anyone the bigger the commission more support i feel if they are uh, performing well uh, they should be given commission can pardon me of course you can. This is meant for interaction. We are in playlist that one thing he was to leaders who are very financially strong and reliable. Right. So they have. They have been... Can you? Are you? Are you listening? Huh? Okay. The point being made, <coughs> channel support. They had very strong dealers. He had a very strong policy, as he says, that even if he got inquiries directly, he would not deal directly. He would send it to the dealers, so that the business is channeled through the dealers and the dealers. So dealers also then had a strong loyalty, saying these people, you know, they treat us like employees. You know, they don't. So that is one support. Any other interaction? Any other interaction? Because I have asked this basic question: any business strategy apart from what you have said here? Tell, tell. Okay, he was a scientist basically, so he know he has identified specialized products. <laughs> he was a scientist, so his main strength his main was strength. he was a chemical or a chemist. So he identified products in that area where right. there is lot of market, where there is lot of profits. And was there were lot of markets? Because he just Not said markets. Markets. that in fact. <laughs> no, identify target markets for the clear cut target market. I think what I will agree with you. Basically, he leveraged his technical expertise. Number one. Number two, he was highly profit conscious. So, any market or any policy where profit would be eroded, he decided as a strategy not to go there. Example, policy of credit business. All right, your working capital is going to go up. So, why go for it if you are getting enough money to fill your plant capacity? With cash sales, why should you go for? That was clearly his strategy. All right. Similarly, when you go through distributive channel, you have a cost which you can hold on to. When you do it yourself, you have costs which are many hidden costs. You have overheads which you take. Moment you take people, set up offices. These are overheads. It's not easy to wind down. If you appoint a dealer, 
and the term is over, you can let him go. So it's always better from cost point of view to move it through dealers. He was very conscious of that. High profits, again, because of high profits, he chose niche market. What is the meaning of niche market? What is the speciality? That means the competition is less. You have a small market, doesn't attract the big boys, so he has high profit there. So what else? So this part of his strategy. It was a R&D driven strategy also and it was a profit driven strategy. Did he want to become a national player and become very big? No. So wasn't that also a part of his strategy? Maybe he was content to have a profitable business which he could manage with least overheads. In the short term, he might be content that because the way energy is glowing, he will soon develop an ambition to go for a national level. Definitely. Yes, he may. He may. He will definitely. Or if he doesn't, his son may. Remember ABC company, the strategy? He wanted to diversify. Anything else? Yes? Alright, okay. So are you making notes? Otherwise you will forget what he has presented. Alright, can we have group 6 now? Thank you very much. Speak into the mic. We will be following the similar pattern what Amit has followed earlier. We start off with the strengths. Uh, it is basically an R&D driven company. It is clearly said he, he is a scientist and he started off by uh, developing a few products for one of his friends which he later marketed and sold on his own. It is an innovation driven company because the nature of the industry is such that you have to innovate continuously. He also selects only niche markets where he gets no competition and he has very high profits. Another strength that the company has is he has handpicked his dealers who are financially very strong. So there is an enormous amount of goodwill and the distribution network is well spread. He is customer oriented and he is in tune with the market. That, hap that, that was seen in more than one occasion where he has followed a product which was launched earlier which was slightly cheaper and then he slowly drove it out of the business. And also he's. Uh, in another way where he is customer oriented is there is a case, uh, there is a situation mentioned where uh, there is a customer who has a problem. There is nothing wrong with the product but he is still willing to change and give, give, uh, give him, uh, replace the product. He keeps a very close eye on the market. What we are trying to say is he is an opportunist. So wherever there is a scope for him trying to enter and make money, he goes for it. He also does not mind withdrawing from a market where he is not able to make money. There is an example of that also given in the case. He has extremely good relationship with all his employees. There are several examples which are given within the case. Then his product mix is extremely flexible. He has made his lines in such a way that he can switch his products. So it's not just sufficient that uh, he has the opportunity to change products, but his plant must also be capable of doing that. Then the return of in on investment which is given, which was mentioned by the other group earlier. All his products are of extremely high quality. Then coming to the uh, weaknesses of the company. So it's a very small company with a no total turnover of only 250 lakhs. So a possible weakness could be how much funds can he allocate for research. There's not sufficient data, but there's a possible weakness. You're not saying that it is a weakness. There's a possible weakness. Another thing is on the production side, he has allocated to and delegated to everybody else. But if you see the dealer side and the customer side, he's doing it himself. There's nothing mentioned in the case whether he's identifying a successor or no. Whereas it's clearly mentioned that as far as production is concerned, it's all well organized and systems are in place. But what about the R&D side and the customer side? Because he essentially is doing everything on his own. Then uh, there's uh, the company size is quite small. So he does not have much power over suppliers and customers as far as materials is concerned. Whatever power he's getting is based on his product. Few threats that we have identified is uh, raw material changes, which is there right in the first uh, thing. The threat for substitutes. Uh, which has also been fairly clearly mentioned that uh, because the nature of the industry is such that a lot of people can easily substitute and there are not many entry barriers. Then there is always a, possible, a possibility because of his size again that he could be bought over by somebody. This is just a suggestion because there is nothing given in the case regarding this. And opportunities. The opportunities are, uh, the very nature of the industry is there are several new products coming up all the time. So he has this opportunity where he can uh, join up with them. Uh, one suggestion that we have given in opportunities, he could patent some of his products, especially the rubber one, the one about uh, the rubber cutting. 
So he has not explored any such possibility. This way, what he does is he gets a monopoly, and nobody else can undercut him. Then, as far as the business plan and strategy is concerned, we'll uh, just describe the industry in brief using the Porter's model. It's already been discussed. The entry barrier, the total, uh, uh, all all his sales. This is uh, the this thing invest investment of 50 lakhs. He's getting sales of 250 lakhs. So based on that, we can say the entry barrier is not very high, and uh, the bargaining power of suppliers. There's a possibility that the raw material keeps changing. It's given in the case. Rivalry. Uh, they mentioned that it's not high, but actually it's quite high in the textile solvents business, which is which makes up 50% of his business. Then there's ample scope for copying. He himself does it. There's every possibility that somebody else also must be doing it. And there's continuous need for innovation. Uh, bargaining power of customers is quite high. There was an example of the textile industry, and uh, there's the example of uh, IOC where he was forced to reduce prices. But uh, one positive side for the players in the industry is the product function is critical. Then threat of substitutes. There are there is a lot of scope for substitution. It's also said that companies are not very uh, willing to make the switch because they feel that it will affect their process and hence their costs. The strategy that he follow, follows is he operates in niche markets because of the same reason. And uh, the, he has a few plans which he uses that he goes into long-term contracts. Relatively speaking, long-term contracts. He also asks for money upfront when he's supplying for the first time. I think after one year, he says uh, he demands some amount of payment. He does not mind copying, and he innovates continuously. He also does not mind undercutting, which is also explained in the case. In fact, if I was to sum up the company's strategy in one word, it would be flexibility and speed. In terms of both products, in terms of copying somebody else, in terms of changing his product line, in ter terms of meeting customer needs, in everything he has shown extreme speed and flexibility. That is the main. That is, I think, his core strength. If I were to sum it up in one word, that would be his strength: flexibility and speed. And uh, that's all we have. All right. Before you end, you have already commented on HR and marketing strategies, or you haven't. Marketing, he is the sole. Uh, marketing, sole you have. What about HR strategy? HR, yeah. I said, one, I mentioned that it's one of his strengths that he has excellent Strength. relationship with his employees and his distributors. All right. So he has generated enormous amount of goodwill. Okay. There's a case where he calls back one of his employees. Okay. So that way have you commented on Dr. Buddy's strategy in managing the environment? Uh, no, we have not. But uh, can I address that point in the sense that he's a scientist? There's a case in which he himself goes to the rubber plantations. Okay. And he finds that out. So that way. Environmental monitoring, you have said. Uh, yes, he is in touch with in touch. the market. Continu he is continuously monitoring the environment, looking out for new opportunities. And change action where necessary. <laughs> change action. What we say, his product lines are flexible all the time. So right. he has the uh, option of changing the product right. lines. He keeps a very close eye on it. And even if that fails, he just and sees it and sees it. He can bring it back to the market. Right. So he is quick to pounce on any new opportunities. So generally, we we have a vote of acclamation for Dr. Buddy. He has no mistakes at all. Everything he has done right. He must be a young man. But the point I'm making is that why he has remained so low in size? Because the nature of his business, the bigger it becomes, it huh? be uh, more. The growth. How many years has he been in business? Huh? Your presentation. All right. I won't steal your thunder. Okay. Any other questions from him? All right. Thank you very much. Now, group number two. All right. Group two. These are your questions, which have to be covered either after your presentation or during your presentation. Okay, right. Sir, Tell me. To start with, did you just what analysis of Dr. Patil's company? Yes. The first and foremost thing is he has a strong R and technology-based company. No, you have you cannot be heard like that. You have to speak loudly, clearly into that mic. First and foremost is that Dr. into it. Don't be bashful. You look all right. Uh. Uh. He has a strong R&D facility, and it's a technology-driven company. And he also believes in reverse engineering. Whenever some product comes up in the market, he analyzes it, and accordingly, he finds out an imitation of that. Mm. This is one of his strategies. 
The second thing is he has a strong distribution network. Leaders are being empowered to take decisions on behalf of the company. And the dealers provided them with a lot of useful information. So they have a good relation with the dealers, which is very important. <coughs> Third thing is he has a flexible pricing strategy. Coupled with that, a flexible product mix. Depending on the market situations, the environment, the demands, he changes the, amount, uh, the kinds of products available to the market. So his company is being driven totally by marketing. He has a good backing from the rubber board. It's being discussed in the case that he has a good backing from the rubber board. Then in certain cases, he delivers superior product qualities and that's why sometimes charges a premium price for it. Then he has a lot of trust being built with the customers. A strong employee policies to take care of the employees, empowerment of the employees. In the case it's been given at one stage, there was a problem with the employee who was being superseded by somebody else outside the company during a promotion. And as a result of which, that person went to uh, Andhavad, I suppose, Bombay. Bombay, from Bombay. Andhavad to Bombay. To Bombay. Hmm. And then again, he didn't like that posting, and but he <laughs> called him back to Andhavad. Then there was strict enforcement of discipline. That's also very important in an organization. They were trying to diversify. <coughs> diversify in the sense they were trying to go for textile as well as rubber as well as paints. I disagree with group one when they say they are looking for a niche market. They are into three, four different industries. After this, note the question, ask after the presentation. They did a cost cutting measure also and they went for second hand or used barrels they bought from some company. Regarding the weaknesses, 50% of the revenues used to come from textiles, which can be a weakness in near future. If textile is not going all right, the company might lose on revenue. Number two is that they, it doesn't seem that they have a formalized organization structure. That might pose a problem later on. Credit sales, they don't have. They might lose business for that. It might be a weakness. Sometimes the bids, sometimes the bids were very high. And as a result of which, uh, they lost a bid from Asian banks. Regarding threats, they're susceptible to imitation. They have low entry barriers. Then there's a scar scarcity or a control of the raw materials, which can be a problem. Then there is a greater forward or backward integration. It can come from a company like IOC, which goes for solvents, or it can come from a textile industry which can go for backward integration goes for solvents. Then uh, they were depending a lot on the rubber board management. There's a problem with the, there is a change in the rubber board management. <coughs> well, regarding opportunities, Ashwin told one of the things, regarding IPS. Second thing is, Reliance requires 70,000 tons per month. So that's again an opportunity for them. And they perhaps can di diversify into chemical industries, into drugs and pharmaceuticals. Well, five years from now. Speak into the mic. <coughs> five years from now, uh, number one, which we feel is relevant, they should try to reduce the percentage revenue from the textile and try other industries also. Then they can supply chemicals to drugs, pharma companies, and not only solvents, something else. Also, if possible. And as the company goes, uh, grows, they should go for a proper structure and proper formalization and standardization. There can be some kind of brand development, so Shantun gave us a suggestion, and it might seem to be humorous. Like, you have Dr. Reddy's lab, you can have Dr. Reddy's lab. Then, number five is uh, you can go on building your R&D strengths because the company's core strength depends on r &D. And we try to fit this into a portal model also. Uh, in the rivalry section, there is a rivalry regarding price, pricing. Like for example, Dr. Bhatti's uh, solvent was priced at 5.15 per liter. And I see uh, produced a new solvent at 4.65. So Dr. Bhatti <coughs> changed the price to 4.60. So there is a rivalry, price rivalry is always there. Then regarding the buyers, 
uh, it seems from the case the, the switching cost is not much. So there is a chance that the buyers or the customers might not be loyal to it in one company. Then uh, regarding the threats, there's a threat of uh, control of raw materials. <coughs> Since the raw materials is being controlled by the government, there's always a threat that they might not be getting their raw materials. And intimidation of substitutes is also there. There is a low barrier to entry, which is a problem. And regarding suppliers, as I mentioned, there is a forward backward integration problem. You have to hurry, you have two minutes. Yes, sir. You have to answer the questions. Sum it up properly. Make a nice summing up. So, so just like Ashwin Ashwin said, huh? flexibility and speed, that was a good punch line to sum up. What are you summing up? Well, what we believe as a group that Dr. Bharti should be considering of R&D and whatever strategy he has, and which is based on the competitive advantage, that is go for the flexibility of uh, the product mix as well as the pricing is pretty all right. Okay. Good. Is that all? Yes. Thank you very much. We will have questions and answers after five minutes break on this. After, because now we have to wind up, you know. You have this reel, so it is finished. There is signal of five minutes. So we will continue after.